Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 60. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzama, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, Glenn. Hello, Christina. How are you? Wonderful. I'm happy to hear that. And you? <laughs> I'm really superb. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman, and I will be your uh, host and medical guide, along with Christina, as we travel through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy, this week searching for optimal health. Pretty excited today about uh, having our special guest, Tony Bark, with us. She's the uh, founder and creator of, of a program on preventive medicine and healing and reversal. And we'll get the exact name of that program and center when we talk to her. But before we do talk to her, I'd like to tell our audience, Christina, how to get in touch with us and with Tony if they have questions. Great. Thank you, Glenn. At any time during this live presentation, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment just by scrolling down on your screen and typing it into that comment box. Be sure to click submit and I can read your question or comment out to our guests or Dr. Woolman. And if you prefer to ask the question yourself, you are more than welcome to dial into our conference line. The number is 323-476-3672. The ID is 607-393-POUND. And if that went by a little too fast, not to worry. That number will show up on the screen during the show. There you go. Hopefully, Thanks, they're all jazzed up with a lot of questions today. Yeah, a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony Bark is the founder and medical director of the Center for Disease Prevention and Reversal which is a very important piece of the uh, pie today. She's an MD. She is also uh, trained and practices classical homeopathy, nutrition, and preventative medicine. She's a teacher. She's an author. She's an international speaker. And we're very happy to have her with us today. Tony, welcome. Hello, Tony. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. It's really good to be back. <laughs> Tony, as the medical guide, I always like to uh, tell our, our viewers uh, the direction that I hope we're going to go. But before I do that, I would like to suggest that in order for people to really learn even more about Tony, you can go back to uh, Trinity of Life, episode 51, where Tony and Christina did a wonderful show on understanding and improving the libido. It's very uh, it's a functional. It's uh, It's got a lot of intelligent uh, information, and it's kind of sexy, actually, I must admit. So aside from that, I want to learn a little bit about you, Tony, uh, how you got to where you are, what interested you in healing. Then we're going to go into some of the work that you do. I know you have a book that, that you're working on right now. I want to talk about that. And I'm hoping that uh, maybe we can get into some actual views of the world of medicine, what's good, what's bad, what's ugly. Maybe we'll have some discussions <laughs> about that. And uh, who knows where else we'll go. We might Wait. even end, end up talking about and improving the uh, libido. <laughs> part, part two. Is that all right with you? Yeah, that's great. I was just thinking, oh, we should have done that show in lingerie. Uh, uh, oh. <clears throat> what? Next. You're not wearing lingerie? <laughs> Underneath this, I am. <laughs> Maybe if everyone, if everyone stays on for the end of the show and we do the post show, <laughs> we'll have a special. I know where moment. you're going with that one. Uh, okay, Christina, stop us. Uh, no, never. Yeah, uh, need we to. need ratings. Remember? <laughs> oh, of course. Anything for the rating. Uh oh. <laughs> so, so where do you want me to start? Well. You know, I I looked at uh, and listened to the Trinity of Life, and uh, the first thing that I I heard, or one of the first things I heard, was that you had an idea that you wanted to be an acupuncturist, so you went to medical school. And right. is that correct? That is correct. <laughs> so that already interests me, and normally I try to uh, get our audience to find the heart and soul of the person we're speaking to. But in this case, I think we're going to find your heart and soul all through this. I'd like to find your mind. Okay. So 
what made you decide that you needed to go to medical school to become uh, an acupuncturist? Well, let me clarify that. So uh, I, I didn't always know I wanted to go to med school. I didn't always know I wanted to be an acupuncturist. I started off in psych and, well, first anthropology, uh, went from uh, cultural to medical or physical anthropology and then morphed into psych. And instead of psych school, psych graduate school at the last minute, I was really interested in the mind and the body and how the mind and body interacts and how it affects social behavior and decided to go to medical school. But I knew I would never practice mainstream medicine. And I just assumed that the only other option really was Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And so when I went to medical school, and the reason I chose to go to medical school and not just go right into Chinese medical school was that I wanted to have clout and I wanted to be able to get into policy possibly and teaching. And I felt that I would have more... um, leverage if I had an MD after my name and not just an OMD. Um, Of course, and I didn't go to Chinese medical school because after medical school and residency, I discovered homeopathy and fell in love with homeopathy. Uh, Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Certainly, uh, having an MD degree opens certain doors that that are difficult to open for people that don't have that degree. That is true. uh, it's interesting that you had that insight that you already knew that you want to get in to get into policy, which means that you probably had some issues with uh, medicine, and hopefully we'll oh, get into that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have many. <laughs> They've only grown. <laughs> the issues have only increased as I've learned more, not decreased. Oh, well. Oh, this is excellent. So we'll find out what's good and what, like I said, what's bad and what's ugly. Uh, when you decided uh, to, oh, by the way, I, I just thought that we are going to have actually a medical anthropologist we're interviewing, I think, in a few weeks. Interesting. Uh, it's yeah. such interesting uh, yeah. work. Yeah, so I'm very uh, fascinated that you had an interest in that also. So you're, you're in medicine, and you, you went into an area that I love very much, which was emergency medicine. And you even became uh, more specialized in pediatric and neonatal intensive medicine. Uh, tell us about that for a few minutes. You must well, have loved that. Yeah, I did. I, I'm, you know, a uh, quintessential ex, um, extrovert and, you know, love adrenaline. And really the only medicine I can practice in the mainstream allopathic medical world is emergency or trauma or intensive care because it's exciting and I feel like you know, that's really the only places that Western medicine gets it right and, and has done some good work. Um, I mean, that's not really fair, being completely fair to Western medicine, but it's really, if you're going to make a generalization, that's the generalization I would make. Um, but I do love that kind of work. I like having, you know, having every second being interesting and, you know, having to figure out what to do. And um, it's exciting, you know, but I did train in pediatrics. And I did a year of rehab and physical medicine training as well. And when I finished my pediatric training at the University of Illinois, um, and I really loved the the ER, and I was already working part-time as an attending while I was a resident in the NICU, um, the head of my of our ER went to University of Chicago and recommended me to take his place. And so I had finished residency and went to Asia for a few months to travel in Nepal and Thailand. And when I came back, had been recommended for the spot and took it um, and was quite excited about it. I loved inner city work and I loved ER work. So I'm glad I did it. I mean, I didn't think I would stay there forever, but um, until I figured out what was next, that was a a great job for me. Uh, And then you got interested in homeopathy a little bit, but uh, what I found when I started to uh, do my work as a medical guide and do my work in integrative medicine and looking at all of the different uh, health systems that exist on the planet, homeopathy was one of those that I I was drawn to it just because it was a healing method that seemed to have uh, success, but I didn't understand it. And I, I think you were the same. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um... Well, let me preface that by saying that when I was 
before the year before starting medical school, I was studying dance and theater and I was living in LA and a friend of my sister's who was an MD PhD candidate at Stanford, who's now a big, big macher in Harvard. Um, he was using homeopathics and my sister and I would make fun of him behind his back. Ooh, <laughs> energized water. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I went to the National Center for Homeopathy's conference that was occurring in Chicago and thought, what the f- are they talking about? You know, like what? I have no idea what these people are talking about. It seems like way out there. But I was very impressed with the caliber of doctors and the caliber of people. And they seemed to know something that I had no idea about. And I wanted to know what that was. So I signed up for the summer school at the National Center. And it was the, in those days, they had a, a professional tract and a lay tract. And the lay tract was huge. It was like, you know, two, 300 people. And the professional tract, international, um, was like 15 of us. And that included doctors, vets, and pharmacists. Inter- international was such a small group. But I fell in love, really loved that ex- experience, and then signed up for many two-year uh, long distance where we'd fly back and forth. It wasn't online in those days. You'd fly to New York for three days. You'd fly to Massachusetts for day- three days or L.A., wherever it was. And so I did many, many uh, programs like that. And um, I would say that the most intelligent and thoughtful and analytic physicians that I have met to date have been the the homeopaths. And, um, and I think the acupuncturists that I've met have been quite, um, as, as thoughtful and analytical and thinkers. You know, I think that people who, especially doctors who leave mainstream medicine to go into homeopathy, um, are thinkers, you know, they don't just accept the status quo stuff that's being pushed by the drug companies, the propaganda. They really think about what is going on, what went wrong. And it's an exciting group to be with. I thought, uh, I, thinkers and also questioners. I think that was yeah. one of the great things that emergency medicine was because we were a brand new specialty uh, at one point. Instead of just taking everything that was taught to us from medical school, we started questioning everything and we made a lot of changes. So I, right. I really appreciate that part of it. So what do you know now that you didn't know then about homeopathy that, that makes it clear? Well, so what I did, didn't know then and what I do know now, what's very clear is that we're energy and the difference between a live person or a live animal and a dead one is, you know, ultimately the electromagnetic energy running through it. Um, you could call it the spirit, the nishama, prana, or, you know, if you think only in really Western terms, the electro, the electricity. Um, but it's not the biochemistry that's different because, you know, a body could die and within a minute you know, or within that second, the, the only difference is the electricity, not the chemistry. So I understand that not everything that can affect a body to improve health or even take away health is necessarily working through the mass dynamic chemical effect, how uh, substances interact with each other on a chemical level, but that they, it could be an influence that is on a quantum mechanic level, on an electric, electrical level. So um, physics and quantum both explain electricity because electricity is um, also magnetic energy, and that's where the quantum comes in. And, um, and so I understand that much more, more easily now. I think it's a shame that we don't teach this in medical school. We, don't, we really don't go into the physics aspect of how the body works. We don't go into the physics aspect of embryology is, is all polar, you know, dipoles and electrical pull. And um, there's embryology of meridians and channels and how electricity runs through our body. And um, this is much more evident to me now than it ever was. And even when I started studying homeopathy, I understood that we were... Um, we worked on frequencies and electricity, but I didn't get to the degree that I do now after the work that I've been doing in the last uh, few years. And you, you teach at uh, medical schools? Well, I teach, well, I have lectured at medical school. So I've been a guest lecturer at University of Chicago. I would come in yearly and um, lecture in their uh, spring program, which was spirituality and medicine. And I would talk about homeopathy. Um, And I've written, been a contributing author for, they have had two textbooks on complementary and alternative medicine. And I wrote the chapters on homeopathy. And I have lectured for their conference, Mayo Clinic on Integrative Medicine. But in the, but I started teaching at, in, 
BU in the medical uh, college, but it's in the graduate medical program, and it's specific for disaster medicine and disaster preparedness. And I teach the psychosocial effects of disaster and the risk communication writing, communication on how to speak to the public about disasters. But my real um, love in, within that field is the psychosocial effects and dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and how people and societies respond to trauma and disasters. Um, and they respond in very specific ways that involve the electromagnetic frequencies and, um, and autonomic nervous system in the body, which runs on electricity. So let's, let's start talking about that with your interest. And then we'll circle back maybe a little bit about, uh, what medicine is about and, and uh, what homeopathy and Chinese medicine and how they can all improve each other, maybe. Uh, so you have a book that you're working on or it's coming out? or Oh, I'm just working on it now. I mean, I, um, I, I had been asked to write last summer and um, I was, I don't know, I was featured, <laughs> giving myself a plug now, but I was featured, I think I mentioned this before, the Oprah July Oprah issue last year, uh, the magazine, and um, uh, an agent called me, a literary agent who called me because his girlfriend had read the article and then read my blog and, and said, oh my God, this woman's got some books in her. And, um, you know, I was encouraged to write a book and the, the article was kind of, it started off being about my work and morphed into a health and beauty article. And, and I do do a lot of, you know, um, I, a lot of the counseling with my patients is how to be the best physically and spiritually. And, you know, I get into some beauty tips and I do some natural aesthetics and a lot of women are quite interested in that. And I teach raw cooking classes. And this is really what I was implored to write, you know, kind of more health and beauty. And I just wasn't excited about writing about that. I mean, I do like putting up my um, recipes and, but I just, my heart wasn't in it. And I wanted to write something a little more weighty and when I wrote a proposal for a book on politics and medicine, I was told, you know, that's great. We want to do this. But it probably, if you do this as your first book, that's all you're going to be known for. And the, the book that I'm writing is something that I'm really excited about. It's the work that I'm doing in my research at BU. Um, I'm waiting to hear if I have a grant that I've applied for at the Department of Defense. Um, I'll know very soon. But I have research going in Texas and at BU. And in the last year, I've really gotten even more into the whole electrical nature of our body and how the autonomic nervous system and our meridians and frequencies are all interplayed together and how early trauma, trauma in, in formative years really set patients or people up to have chronic illness and chronic pain and chronic disease. And that's something that I understood, but now that I teach the psychosocial effects of disaster and I do research on it and see what other people are looking at and, and the results of research that's been out there before me in terms of who has higher anxiety levels and the level of adaptation. And of course it's women, you know, and I think I mentioned this in, um, even, I think it came up in the last conference, last talk that we did on the, this TV network on the libido show, but women ha are twice as likely to go into anxiety modes. And, you know, my theory is that it's an adaptive response to nurturing and raising the young and living in a dangerous world. And it's an evolutionary response because women who could go into fight and flight mode easily and be more hypervigilant probably were able to keep their young alive long enough for them to procreate. And then of course those genes were passed on. Um, but we do know that that's the case. And I do think that it's a hypervigilant nature of the um, of the autonomic nervous system to be in fight and flight, which is um, a response that keeps us alive in times of danger. But it is also a response that prevents us from healing because you have to have increased vegetative tone or rest and relaxation or vagal tone in order for our tissues to heal. And it is an epidemic. In fact, we see men and women with, you know, stuck in this hyper vigilant state. And so people are starting to look and pay attention to heart rate variability, heart rate variability, um, which really looks at the tone of the heart based on speeding up and slowing down with respiration. And if your rest and relaxation part or arm of your autonomic nervous system is balanced with your fight and flight, you will see a slowing down of the heart rate with your exhalation. And if you don't see that, we know that the 
the fight and flight tone is just overriding. And that's, you puts you at risk for sudden death and heart attacks and uh, stress reactions and increased, all kinds of increased diseases and pain syndromes and anxiety and, uh, cross cross hatching or flip diurnal patterns of cortisol, waking up in the middle of the night and more predisposed to addiction for food and drugs and alcohol. So it's a very important, um, body function to look at. And that was a really long winded answer. <laughs> So that was a good one, though. That I was must excellent. Say. <laughs> I think you you threw in libido and kept our attention. Of course, I'm always going to throw that in. <laughs> excellent. So thank you for that. The you know with with many of our guests uh, that are healers, they always talk about the early childhood trauma and how that sticks and how it how it presents itself many years later or continuously through your life and sometimes unrecognized. Right. Uh, Look, can we talk about that for a few moments? Yeah, how, I'd love to. Yeah, how it, I mean, it's clear to me as, a, as an emergency physician, somebody comes in from an auto accident and I see the trauma of a broken arm, but sure. we're talking about some deeper things than that. And the first part is I would like you to uh, address how that sticks in the mind. And then the second part would be, what could we do at the very moment that this happens to children? Uh, to potentially prevent things. You talk about preventative medicine. So what should we be doing in emergency medicine and in general practice and just being a parent, knowing that your child went through a trauma, how to heal from that quickly so it doesn't become fibromyalgia and migraines? So trauma can be anything. And, you know, kids who fall from the jungle gym and break their arm um, if they have loving parents and they felt taken care of, that usually isn't going to be the trauma that I'm talking about. More likely, it's going to be somebody whose parent, you know, one of their parents is angry or alcoholic or somewhat abusive verbally or physically or sexually, of course. Those, are, those ones are obvious. Um, but it can be where they had an appendicitis or something happened, the parents were around and they felt scared and it somehow stuck with them. I mean, certainly it can be a single event that was quite traumatizing in their childhood, but more commonly, it's going to be a childhood where they did not feel safe in their home environment. Um, they were bullied by an older sibling or uh, a parent who, you know, told them they were worthless and nothing and piece of, sh you know, whatever. I'm not going to, I don't know. I don't know if this counts for like HBO, if you can just swear. Um, but you know, well, you can swear, go ahead and swear. Okay. <laughs> so, swear. So it's those kind of things that more commonly lead to it's ongoing repetitive. Um, it's an ongoing repetitive environment where you don't feel safe. And that's usually what predisposes people. And what is happening is that it does get stuck in your body. It's really more in your body. I mean, your brain is the control, the master control. The anterior hypothalamus, which is in the front of the brain, uh, controls the tone of the autonomic nervous system. And going into fight and flight where you don't feel safe because you want to be, you're, you're hypervigilant. It's, it's an evolutionary response. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a bus about to hit you. It could be you're being told you're a piece of shit and you might get smacked, you know? Um, so if you don't know if that's going to come around the corner and it could come any time, you're constantly waiting for it to happen. And so your anterior hypothalamus is, is always not ratcheting up a notch, the, that autonomic nervous system response of fight and flight. And what I find in the adults who come in with chronic pain or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue uh, and or all kinds of environmental, anything chronic, anything where your body can't get past an illness, an infection. It could be uh, pain from an injury, but you know, a normal healthy body should get past it. You know, you know, you get hit by a bus, you crack your hip. Yeah, it's really painful. But a year or two later, you know, you might have pain when the weather changes. You know, a little arthritic in the pain in there, but your whole body should be going into like an RSD kind of syndrome. I mean, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or a neuropathic syndrome. Those patients, you can bet, had early setup. There, it's it's as if their tone is so high that it's just waiting for one more thing, and one more thing happens, and it's the last straw, and now it won't let go. It won't let go, and so nothing can heal because literally your tissue cannot heal without decreased 
decreased activity of that sympathetic response. And so it does get stuck in your body. It's your brain doing it. But there's, when I use my, I have a device that measures impedance and wherever there's increased sympathetic tone, there's decreased impedance because there's greater electrical flow because it's moister and there's more electrical activity going on there. So I can see where the impedance is lowered and see exactly where, and it's usually behind the heart, oddly enough, it's the heart chakra. Uh, it's behind the heart somewhere, usually in that sympathetic chain between T1 and T12 that needs to be worked on. And if you work or talk to body workers who are quite intuitive, they will tell you w- with a patient that like I'm working with, they'll say, oh yeah, I noticed, you know, that's where the energy was blocked. I could tell, or that's where their muscles were, you know, there's tightness and needs to be released. And so an intuitive body worker, whether they're a physical therapist or a napropath or a Pilates, uh, I've worked with people who are Pilates specialists who totally get it. Um, Me too. They, yeah, they kind of know exactly where the block is just from how they touch the body and work with the body and see where it's coming from. Um, and so it's very real and it's, it's measurable. You know, I measure these things on, with my device. Um, and you have to retrain the body that it, it's not always in danger. It doesn't have to always be waiting for that other shoe to drop. And, you know, people have different levels of resilience and some of that is genetic. Resilience is something that I look at being a disaster manager and we, we teach this in class. And, you know, there are people, I would say half of the population is born with more resilience than the other half. So, you know, the same trauma can happen to, you know, 50 people and um, even early in life and not all, of course, some of it has to do with, you know, are they, do they feel taken care of by their parents or their home? Do they have a nurturing school life? You know, are they bullied when they go to school and then come home and get bullied by a sibling? You know, that, so a lot of it has other, there's other issues, but when we do testing for resilience, it does seem that there are some people who are naturally you know, just the way their nervous system is set up, they're set up with a little more resilience. And there's also something called transgenetic um, passage of trauma. And I've written about it and studied it. And I uh, wrote about grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. Now it's happened with many groups, but um, I was treating as a homeopath, a lot of young kids about in the mid nineties with uh, night terrors. And the Mm -hmm. one thing that they had in common where their grandparents were Holocaust survivors. Now I live in an area, you know, Chicago's got a big Jewish community and Skokie, which is very close to me, has a lot of Holocaust survivors. I think the most than anywhere else than other than Israel. And, um, it was one after another, you know, all these little kids with, with night terrors and they all, and even one kid who was clearly not Jewish, they were Hispanic, and I said, you know, it's so interesting. It's the first kid who's not a grandchild of a Holocaust survivor. And she said, oh no, my, you know, um, the mom was Hispanic, the father is Polish and his father, not Jewish, but he was, he was imprisoned as a, a prisoner of war during the Holocaust. So, um, I wrote about it and I wrote about it as a thesis paper in my class in grad school. And we do know that resilience can have something to do with genetic passage of trauma, with the way your nervous system is set up with early exposure, possibly as an infant. Um, if you, you know, maybe were left to cry, didn't get your your needs met or felt unsafe for whatever reason. So it resilience is complicated. It can be taught. Uh, that's where there's a fair amount of research right now looking at how do you teach resilience to individuals? How do you teach resilience to communities? How do you prepare communities to be resilient? So a lot of that has to do with our electrical nature because anxiety is felt and communicated in the body through electricity. And then ultimately chemically, of course, because then you've got the whole cortisol response and things like that, epinephrine and and norepinephrine. We interviewed uh, Dr. Hui Huang a few weeks ago, who is an internist and an integrative medicine practitioner. And he spoke to us about a a tool that he uses that uh, measures frequencies and impedance. I wonder if they're similar. It would be interesting to find that out. I want to ask you if you think that uh, this is an area where in medicine you talk about preventive medicine, preventative medicine, and teaching, should we be uh, teaching our teachers and medical students uh, to be more vigilant about children 
that they're watching that might be having these early traumas? You know, if you say a lot of it happens in the home, clearly the family or the parents are not going to be the teachers that are going to help them out of it. It's going to be the physician and family practice or the teacher or uh, uh, someone from a religious area. Should we well, be teaching schools, them? Well, I, yes, we should. And um, there is a small push for that. I would say that a lot more schools are, be, are having, adopting zero tolerance with bullying. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've seen that clearly like with my... You know, we have three boys that went through the system here, and my my son, the youngest, who's 16 now, there was really zero tolerance. He's at a public school. There, were, you know, pretty much zero tolerance for bullying. It definitely at grade school. Um, you know, junior high, you have less control over the kids, but even then, there was pretty much zero tolerance for bullying. And I do think that 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 teachers are more aware, and that's you know, teachers used to bully the kids. I mean, it used to be the teachers, right? And I think there's really no tolerance for teachers who call kids names and stupid. And um, I mean, th those those teachers will get in big trouble. But that wasn't always the case. I mean, you know, especially if you hear people who went to Catholic schools and how they were, um, you know, physically abused by the teachers. But um, I, I, I think that most doctors, unfortunately aren't going to take the time. Maybe they can't take the time there. You know, a pediatrician is going to hear whatever the parents tell them. So if the parents are part of the problem, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get much. Um, and you know, I hear from my patients and I have two hour initial visits, you know, but I hear from my patients that the pediatrician or their internist never asked them anything. They they're lucky if they get five to 10 minutes with their doctor. So we should be making students, grad, you know, medical students more aware, but I don't know that in reality it's going to play out. And there's also, you know, funding. What gets funded at medical schools and institutions? What gets funded is what gets money. Um, so they're going to teach what's funded, and what's funded is usually research in pharmacology because pharma is funding a lot of medical schools. I mean, 30, you know, 30 years ago, um, oh, wow. Yeah. I started med school 30 years ago and that wasn't the case. You know, government funding was the majority of funding for research that was going on at institutions and medical schools. And that's not the case anymore. Um, and so there's a big bias in pharmacology and it's only getting worse. The DSM-5 is out and um, a lot of things have been rearranged. So normal grief reaction is something that can be medicated. Um, if you look at the actual, <coughs> excuse me, psych studies on antidepressants, if you actually bother to read them, you'll see that antidepressants have very little eff effectivity and they're only really recommended based on their studies for severe depression. But if you see how they, they are, um, the recommendations are reworded in the manuals by groups of psychiatrists that are all paid keynote speakers by the industry, they've reworded those recommendations to make it sound as though mild and moderate depression, and I'm not making this up, mild and moderate depression, you, know, you can use antidepressants for mild and moderate depression unless, unless your patient prefers electroshock therapy. Hmm. Wow. That's right out of the new, yeah, that's right out of the new handbook. Um, yeah, I think hmm. my patient with mild depression would prefer <laughs> electroshock therapy. Let's ask huh? them. Wow. And and the warnings for suicide uh, has gone off the packaging. You know, it's not there. And there's a big push for making people aware of the uh, warnings on, on antidepressants and all the psych meds have a lot of problems. So I think the push, unfortunately, in these institutions and the med schools is really pushing towards pharmacology and away from understanding the patient and spending time and, and recommending things that don't make the industry money, like meditation and deep breath work and yoga and um, those kinds of uh, practices. Mm, the ones that are free? Yeah. <laughs> the ones that pharma's not making any money off of? Yeah. Um, Tony, uh, a couple of questions came in uh, during this show, um, and I'll share them with you. Uh, a question is, how do you get involved as a community member in helping PDS? So I'm assuming that means post. I'm not sure what they mean by PDS. What's PDS? Hmm. 
Okay, so that's a question that goes out there. <laughs> Back to you. Um, and uh, another one that came in is, as a yoga instructor, I'm very interested in learning more about this fight or flight trauma and how to acknowledge or work on this with students. Well, I can tell you that the research on heart rate variability and improving it, which has, again, I'll reiterate what that is. Heart rate variability is the, the in a healthy body where there's a balanced tone between fight and flight and rest and relaxation. Your heart rate is not just bum 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 bum. It actually should speed up with inspiration and, and um, slow down with expiration. And what some of the, there's a few centers, just a few of institutions that have centers looking at heart rate variability. And one of the recommendations, they've looked at different uh, prescriptions of breath work for meditation. And the one that seems to be the most effective is slowing the, the breath down to five times a minute, which is slow because most people breathe on average 16 to 20 times a minute, but they don't use anywhere near the full capacity of their lungs. So slowing your breath rate down to five times a minute and exhaling twice as long as inhaling. And so what I tell my patients when I try to sit with them to show them how to sit in an open-eyed seated Zen meditation is um, to, you know, initially just focus on their breath and keep their eyes open and just, you know, count in their head initially, because, you know, it's very hard to clear your mind, but to count, try to count to five, maybe six for that inhalation and try to count to eight or 10 on the exhalation without ever holding the breath. And that within two to three minutes, all my patients will tell me that they feel a shift, that they actually feel more relaxed and, um, that it feels good. And so by doing that, you know, doing breath work with your yoga students, and I think chanting is amazing. The reason that chanting is amazing is that it trains people to exhale over a very long period. And so while some people be, you know, their response to chanting is, ooh, you know, that seems so um, contrived, the chanting can be amazingly helpful when you're really holding a note, like holding that ohm for as long as you can and learning to use your full breath and use your diaphragm. Unbelievably helpful. Mm, beautiful. Um, so they came back. It's, um, I, I'm assuming, PTS, post-traumatic stress. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Right. So post-traumatic stress again, is where there, it's basically anxiety. It's anxiety disorder where somebody underwent a trauma, something happened and there's either flashbacks or even though it's not in their forefront of their consciousness, in the middle of driving or in the middle of eating or in the middle of sleeping, they'll suddenly have palpitations or feel anxiety or wake up from sleeping. And that's a post-traumatic stress response and again, if I used my device to measure their autonomic nervous system, I would find uh, a, a lot of reduced impedance in the mid-back between T1 and T12, mm. and often on the face, uh, one of the uh, where the nerves come out, so here, here, and here, um, one of those spots, and typically it's it's this one, will be also uh, really hyped up, and we'd see decreased impedance, and I can I can adjust that with my device. Um, which I would say is probably equivalent to several uh, acupuncture sessions, you know, um, because I'm dialoguing with the electrical, uh, the electrical nature of the device is that it dialogues immediately with the anterior hypoth hypothalamus, mm -hmm. but you can achieve the same thing. It just takes a lot longer and a lot more repeated sessions through acupuncture, through meditation, through breath work, um, EF, EFT, some of these freedom, emotional freedom techniques with tapping can, can get there. Um, homeopathy, you get the right remedy that can get there. But, um, the device that I use, which is Skinar, it, it's, you know, it's, what's beauty. The beauty about it is that I see somebody once, once or twice and we're done because 
you know, it's dialoguing immediately with the anterior hypothalamus and I can use one on their back and then, and then open up the meridians by using another one on their feet. Um, and then hands and, uh, even their eyes, I have a special eyepiece, which kind of looks like a S and M dominatrix device, but it's not, um, <laughs> our ratings just went up, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of ways to get there. Some are faster than others, but breath work, meditation, um, you know, EFT, acupuncture, anything that will adjust the electrical nature of the body. And that, and one of the ways of doing that is deep breath work because it really, it allows for that tone to come down. And then you get chemical changes. You know, then you get an increase in GABA, which is a hormone that's released to reduce stress and relaxes us. Um, so then you start seeing the, the chemical changes, but the chemical changes are secondary to the electromagnetic mm-hmm. changes. Mm-hmm. So, so would you say that, like, for example, um, the skinar, I think that's what you were calling your mm-hmm. unit. So yes. is it like, like putting electrodes on the body? It's and- a handheld device that looks like an electric razor, kind of. I mean, it really looks like, you know, it's like the size of a, a, a phone or something. Mm. Um, but I can attach electrodes, like, to the feet and then set, have a certain setting to open up meridians. And then I can use it, attach it, and uh, set it a certain way um, and put a pad on the back. Or I can touch it right on, and there's electrodes, and I can measure the impedance directly. Mm-hmm, it is a mm-hmm. class two device in this country, so it's a um, you need a prescription. There are home use devices, home units that um, some of my patients, mostly my patients who are athletes, wind up buying because it's great for. It, it is FDA approved in this country at this point only for pain and injury. There are devices similar to it that just go on the head that are class three devices approved for insomnia and depression, but. Um, I find that using this device on the body works better than, than the, the transcranial devices, but they're great devices and they are approved. Um, so, you know, it's not, uh, the, the, the technology came out of Russia with the cosmonaut program and was really, the torch was carried, I would imagine through, uh, the Olympic athletes because it's been used in with the Russian athletes and the Eastern European athletes for uh, two decades now, uh, preparing them for races and also with their injuries. And it's made its way around the globe and it's much more popular in other, in some countries than others, not very popular in the States, but I was lecturing in Australia in October at a pan Australia Asian conference just on Skinner. Mm -hmm. And, and, but then when, for example, if, one has a treatment with these units, but they don't shift their lifestyle. They need another treat- oh, if they don't shift their lifestyle. Yeah, yeah because, I, I mean, if, if we're looking at, if, if I am assuming this is um, uh, about wellness and creating the balance, right, then it becomes like anything else. If we don't make the shift in our lifestyle to prevent it from happening again, Yeah. So let me talk about that for a second, because a lot of bad behavior that people do is because there's underlying anxiety. There's underlying uh, angst. And once you reduce that, it's easier to not reach for the fast food or the candy or the junk or the pop because people or the cigarettes or the alcohol. Because people do that to stuff feelings down, to stuff anxiety down. I mean, they really do. It's addiction. And addiction, the theory on addiction is there's an underlying trauma. Um, And so once you can make that, it's a a shift. You know, I look at it as when a plane, a jet plane comes into land, it doesn't, when it puts on the brakes or has to stop, it's not like suddenly reversing, but the there's a slight shift in the inside the, that jet engine, the, the angle shifts. So there's a shift. Um, and when you make that shift, there's something that happens at a very deep level. This happens with giving somebody the right constitutional homeopathic remedy. You know, mm-hmm. there is a profound shift and people suddenly say, I don't, I don't need the bag of chips and the pop. I don't need to drink a half a bottle or a bottle of wine at night. I, I'm tired. I want to go to bed. I feel safe to go to bed and go to sleep. You know, it's, there's a shift that happens. Now, that being said, there are people that are very invested at a very deep level in being ill 
or mm. always being a victim. Um, you know, there, what I would say in Yiddish, they're mishugas, because there's just no word outside of Yiddish that really, it's craziness, <laughs> I guess what you'd say, but it's their shtick, you know, it's their stuff that is just, and sometimes it takes a few treatments and hand-holding, but when people feel good and don't feel anxious, as long as they're educated about what's good and what's not good, what's healthy, what's not healthy, they'll do the right thing. It's when they have emotional issues that they will repeat the same insanity, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, you know, that's what I have found. And so if you can make that subtle shift in somebody, it's basically, you're putting different lenses on them. They're looking at life through different lenses. Suddenly, you know, things are rose colored and bright and sunny. And you know how, look how powerful it is to have like, well, I don't know if you guys know this in California, but you know, I can tell (laughs) you that you know, to have four months of gray, cold, rainy, blah. And the next, suddenly we've got 70 degrees of beautiful, bright sun. I mean, it's as though you're now looking through different lenses and you behave differently. You don't, you know, you behave differently. So, um, making that shift really is powerful. It's so powerful that most people will then tell, you know, come back and say, oh my God, I just naturally, well, well, you know, when I was in Australia, I saw this guy was, he had one treatment with Skinner, who was a Vietnam vet from Australia. And this was in Sydney in the clinic. And I saw him on his first follow-up and it was two weeks after his first treatment. He said, I've stopped with all the sugar. I've lost 20 pounds. This was in two weeks. I'm not drinking pop and eating sugar. I've taken my surfboard out and started getting it ready to get on the, get out there. And he said, I just feel completely different after, you know, decades of severe depression. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I hear all the time. Mm. But again, that being said, there are people that are incredibly invested in their negativity and they need all kinds of, um, they, they need a few treatments, but those are the exception to the rule, but they exist. They really Mm. do exist. I want to get back to, uh, some of the things, those those were great answers and great Mm. questions from, uh, uh, our audience, and also from you, Christina, uh, as our every person representative. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to get back to something you had, had spoken about before, and maybe a little controversial now, when you alluded to the uh, treatment of natural grieving with medication. I remember many times in the emergency department, uh, a grandparent or a uh, a matriarch of a family might die, and there are many people around the the bed, and each of them dealing with things in their own way. But every once in a while, there was someone who was uh, much more profound uh, grieving at that moment. And the natural inclination from everyone around was to come to me, to approach me, to give that person medication. And wow. what I usually did was to try to take that person aside and work with them a little bit and talk to them about the natural process and that by giving them a medication, we would be delaying the process a certain amount. So I would, I would still offer them the opportunity, but I tried to convince them. And it usually seemed that that person agreed to that and understood it where it was the people around them sometimes that were pushing it. Right. And so when we talk about this and farm, big pharma and things like that, that are involving uh, all of medicine right now in terms all of, of medicine, all what? aspects, uh, but psych, psych is um, really, uh, there, there's real egregious behavior going on in, in the psych medical world. Like uh, it's really psych. I would say the worst fields right now are really vaccines and psych meds, just unbelievable uh, lack of transparency, keynote speakers being paid who, who come on the radio as experts, but they're really paid, uh, you know, mouthpieces for the industry, even at the academic level, especially at the academic level, in fact. In fact, that is where the biggest problem is because now it's at the academic level and in the academic journal level. So it's a real problem. It's, um, it's pervasive and it does delay you know, it, it encourages to delay real psychological processes that need to go on with loss and with anger and with sadness and with grief. And um, it's it's potentially a huge problem. 
So what's, where do we, as you and I, for example, and Christina in our different aspects of health and healing and other people and consumers, uh, as we're getting an understanding now of the possibility that, as you're saying, it's involved in everything, it's pervasive, it's in government, how do we trust anymore? How do we know what to do? And how do we change things? Well, I would tell you that there's journals that are popping up that are peer-reviewed, that people in academia who are tired of the ghost writing going on in the mainstream journals and with the pharmaceutical industry are creating newer online journals. And I would say that also Cochrane and PLOS um, tend are big to, study you know, groups. Yeah, yeah, tend to look at at these issues. Public Citizen actually looks at a lot of these issues. Um, first, you know, one of the problems that doctors don't read studies. They don't read studies. They don't care to read studies. They don't know how to read studies. They don't know how to look at the biases in studies. It's not taught in med school. It's not taught in residency. That's for a real reason. I don't think the industry, you know, it's a medical industrial complex at this point. And there is no way that that's going to be taught because Nobody wants doctors to know the realities. They want them to be so busy that they just are told what to do by the drug reps. And if they're lucky enough, they get taken to dinner and they maybe get hired to be a spokesperson for the industry and make big bucks. And they're not going to question it and they're not going to ask. And they don't want to know. I've literally had doctors tell me, I don't want to know the realities because if I knew the realities, I would have to change the way I practice and I don't have time for that. Hmm. Yeah. I've heard that before too. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that's scary stuff. Real scary stuff. Um, and, but I've been told that a few times. Um, you know, they think that everything they're practicing is so well studied and proven. But when you look at the Cochrane studies, I'm sorry if you hear my dog. <laughs> Somebody at the door. When you look at the Cochrane studies on, let's say, stat or antidepressants or um, flu vaccine, you know, you see very clearly it's not anything like what you're reading in the mainstream journals or from your drug rep, like nothing, you know, opposite, in fact. So what's your solution? Caveat Antar as a physician, I mean, you know, I just think as a physician and as a patient, you need to be smart, you need to be educated, you need to question and not buy the um, status quo, not by what I call the truisms, because they're not truths, they're truisms. You know, it's scientism. What's going on in medicine today is scientism. It's not science. Um, it's almost at a, to a religious belief, like, oh no, statins save lives and um, help everyone. And, you know, that is not the case. Um, we've got so many drugs that are prescribed and for, for the very thing they're prescribed for are the very things they cause. So you've got antidepressants increasing suicidal behavior and suicidal, suicidology and even homicidology because homicidal, uh, thoughts are very similar to suicidal thoughts, um, just turned outward. And you've got statins that actually can increase your risk for uh, heart attacks because they're driving the density particle of the LDL deeper and making them more dense in some cases and increasing the risk for diabetes. You've got diabetes drugs that increase the risk for diabetes and denser LDL and more insulin resistance. Um, you've got bisphenates that are prescribed for osteoporosis, but they're actually increasing the risk of bone fracture a few years down the road. So, um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of craziness and Again, I can't say how more important it is to look at the body as an electrical being that really the future is going to be in what Glaxo calls and what GlaxoSmithKline is putting lots of money into are bioelectroceuticals. Hmm. Of really a fancy word for what I would call homeopathy because you know if it's going to be a, a bioelectroceutical, it's going to have a mild frequency and that's really what homeopathy is. But they're putting money into bioelectroceuticals and you can bet that other pharmaceuticals are. We know they are because nanotechnology, nanoparticles and molecules are now being recognized and there's more and more research uh, being funneled into, into nanoparticles. And that's, again, um, they work because of their electrical nature more so than their biochemical nature. Uh, these things are seen on spectroscopy, st structural spe spectroscopy, not chemical spectroscopy. So Raman, not FTIR. Um, 
you know, so I think that's where the future is. And I think the drug companies know that, but they need to still white, you know, kind of, um, sell their drugs because that's what they've got stockpiled and that's where they've invested their money. And they're going to do whatever it takes to convince the medical community that that's what they need to be pushing. And that's how they're going to make their money, the medical community. You know, that's, so it's not that doctors are corrupt per se. There are doctors who are keynote speakers that are paid that don't, don't disclose it and don't, um, and they know what they're saying is full of shit, but pardon my French, but most doctors just don't know the reality. It, most doctors are just naive and really nice and don't imagine that this stuff is going on and can't believe it. Now, what do you, what do you feel about uh, the nutraceuticals? I mean, do you feel that there's same things out there that, that uh, the nutraceutical companies are pushing certain things that may be just as bogus but oh, yeah. I mean, you know, like, you know, every week there's a new weight loss supplement that Dr. Oz is promoting, <laughs> you know, I mean, whether it's raspberry keto, I don't know. It's like all this stuff, like, come on. But on the other hand, there's some really good, solid nutraceutical producers that really have some great products out there. And I think that people should have access to nutraceuticals. There's a medical fascism that's going on right now where they're trying to pass this codex where uh, nutraceuticals and vitamins will go into the prescription level and, and doctors will have to recommend them, prescribe them, and they'd be controlled because drug companies see that they're losing market share. You know, people are getting wise and reading about, well, I can lower my blood pressure by taking, you know, this herb or this herb and doing some meditation. Why do I have to take these drugs that have these horrible side effects? I mean, calcium channel blockers, they cause swelling and edema. And they actually, Public Citizen has a warning out that they cause more death in patients with high blood pressure than less death. So why, you know, but yet doctors mm. prescribe calcium channel blockers for people with high blood pressure all the time, but you're increasing the risk of death. I mean, it's, it's craziness. So, you know, while there's going to be bad people in every organization and, and there's going to be bad organizations in every consortium, there are very good nutraceutical companies that are doing their due diligence and they're not making outrageous claims. They're not even allowed to make these claims. I mean, this is the thing, you know, the drug companies are allowed to make bogus claims about their drugs, but the FDA will come after your ass if you make it intimate a claim on something that really works because it's not patentable, it's, it, it's not being promoted by a drug company. The FDA, by, by, with, with very few exceptions, I mean, I think the, the, the scientists lower down are not corrupt, but the ones at the top we know from whistleblowers who have come forward, the FDA is working for the industry. They're not working for us. They're not looking to protect us. They're looking for their next job in lobbying and pharmaceutical or working for Merck and Glaxo. I mean, they are, um, they have the industry's best interest at, at hand and not ours. And, you know, there is a war going on to get supplements and nutraceuticals out of the public's reach and make it so they have to go to the doctors who know nothing about these things for the most part, who are not trained in them, who don't know anything about nutrition, and have them as the gatekeepers so they can be at a prescription level um, and owned by the pharmaceutical industry. It's unbelievable war right now, and it's nothing but medical fascism. I mean, I know it sounds um, extreme, but I don't know what else to call it. We're going to have to organize a billion, trillion, gazillion person march yeah. And and figure out how to take back uh, all of our systems. Uh, I'd love well, to it's have such you. Paternalism too. You know, it's really you know we know better. We know yeah right. Like the doctor knows better how to keep people healthy. I mean, most doctors are crisis managers, and they're not even managing big crises. They're like you know, you see your doctor repeatedly for for sinus infections and strep throats, but yet you're getting them all the time. How is your doctor helping you if you don't, if he's not helping you or she's not helping you not get them anymore? That mm -hmm. is just managing. You wouldn't go to a finance manager like that, you know, who's constantly losing your money. And so then you go back to them so they can lose more money for you. I mean, you would fire them in a, in a second. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, a comment just came in. This is a great show. <laughs> Are they a relative of mine? <laughs> I didn't tell anyone. You know, I should have. I really 
should have posted on my Facebook and on my website that I was doing this, but I'll post this afterwards like I did the last one. <laughs> We're speaking with Dr. Tony Bark. Uh, she's a medical doctor and a doctor of classical homeopathy. She also uh, has her center for uh, disease uh, prevention and reversal. And Tony, we know that you've given us a lot of tips and I would like to ask you if you have a health tip for us today, but this may be an opportunity if you want to refer back to uh, your talk with Christina about uh, improving the libido. <laughs> yeah, let's talk. Or Do you orgasms. have a health tip on, a health tip on I orgasms? Feel like, I feel like Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Who <laughs> 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 orgasms? Masturbate. <laughs> Well, thank you. That was a perfect. No, but oh, the that, that, wasn't that I tip? talked about is, is really good. You know, if you can sit in meditation, even if you just start at 10 minutes a day with slowing down your breath to, you know, um, five, five breaths a minute with exhalations twice as long as inhalations, counting and focusing on your breath, you will find that at the end of the week, it made a huge difference in your life. Hmm. Christina, any uh, thoughts? I totally agree. I, I think that's, that is uh, all around uh, for for every whatever anyone is dealing with health wise or physical wise in pain that meditation and that breath work is so powerful it is so powerful and there's so much resistance to it i can't even tell you well I, <laughs> you know and 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 i do believe it's um because when people think of meditation uh the layman thinks of meditation and i i was one of them i think oh it's about well, I, I don't think I can sit that long, you know, because one minute and two minutes. But when when you say it's something simple, and you don't call it that, you know, just tell someone, you know, just breathe. Let's just count and breathe. They have no idea that they're actually doing it. You know, right. it's, it's it's the stigma up here. You know, <laughs> it's like what what that individual has has, uh, however they were brought up or culturally or in the society of, oh no, I have to keep moving. I have to keep thinking. I have well, to keep... and it's usually the patients that need it the most will say, I can't do it. Or they'll say they can't do yoga. I can't, I, I'm too, I, I get too bored too quickly. I, I feel too anxious. I can't do it. I can't say Right, right. I'm yes. like, yeah, you're the one. You really need to. <laughs> that answer, I can tell. You need to do it. <laughs> That's where I practice my metaphor square breath. Tony, yes. is there anything that uh, we have not covered that you want to bring up that you're going to, when the show ends, say, oh, I forgot to talk about that, or I wish I had an opportunity? You know, I have on my website links to my lecture on um, a PowerPoint that I, presentation that I did in Australia on the electrical nature of the body and how electromagnetic um, medicine is our future and how it's our past. And I also have a lecture on raw food, why raw food rocks and a lecture on my research in Haiti, from Haiti. Um, mm. So I think that there's a lot of information on my site and my blog at disease-reversal.com. Um, so whatever I forgot, I'm sure I said it there. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, you'll have to have me back. Yes, we'll have you back. And I'd like to have you on a panel with some other people that that might, maybe we can get someone from the pharmaceutical industry to talk with us. That's fine. I that will have to be a two-hour show. <laughs> and I although you never know. You never, never know. know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very grateful to our special guest, Dr. Tony Bark, for sharing her wisdom and expertise with us and our audience. I would also thank, like to thank my teachers and my healers for allowing me to continue on my journey. And until next week, I look forward to... Uh, going in another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy with Christina, searching for uh, health. But until that time, I would like to say thank you very much, Dr. Tony Bark, for your uh, participation with us. Uh, we are grateful. And thank you, Christina and Segovia, and to all the people at Yoga Hub for uh, putting this show on. And until next week, I wish you all optimal health. And thank you, Dr. Glenn Woolman and Dr. Tony Bark. It's so much. This was fun. <laughs> this <Yep>. was fun. <laughs> thank you so much. And we look forward to having you back again. That's oh, I look forward uh, to coming back. Um, and of course, we'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us on this new platform of information education. We are grateful for your continuous support and look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. We invite you to join us live on Tuesdays for Magical Medical Tour at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 Eastern, Wednesdays for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 
followed every other week with Flowing into Awareness with Anatara. And may I remind you that you can contact Dr. Glenn Woolman by following him on Twitter, at Glenn Woolman, and of course through his own site, glennwoolman.com, where you can learn about his metaphor square breath. Again, we are always grateful to have any feedback. You are very welcome to dial into 818-LET'S-TALK, 818-LET'S-TALK, and leave your comments or questions there, and uh, we will respond to you. Thank you, and until we meet again, namaste. people, you know, behind the closed door, and I don't mean in the bedroom with me, I mean in my office, in my consult room, <laughs> um, you know, because I'm so frank about it and yes. I just come right out and ask my patients, you know, how's your orgasms, you know, how are you functioning, that they get pretty comfortable talking about it because it's no big deal for me to talk about it and mm -hmm. I make them very comfortable and most people want to talk about it because I I've seen patients who've been in therapy, who've been in analysis and haven't.